Hello everyone and welcome to today's lunchtime webinar on the director's duty to creditors. My name is Iris Chu. I'm director of the Center for Ethics and Law at UCL. This is the research center that's bringing us this event uh, this lunchtime. We have assembled a panel of distinguished commentators in company law to discuss the recent Supreme Court decision in BTI and Sequana, and in particular, the clarifications on the director's duty to creditors. The webinar proceedings will be as follows. I have prepared a set of questions for our panelists and will be asking the panelists each question in turn. However, I do invite the audience as you hear the question and you have thoughts on uh, the question as well as what the panelists might be saying, please feel free to submit your comments and your thoughts on the Q&A function on the webinar. We hope to be able to gather these and address these at the same time that the relevant question is being dealt with. So hopefully this does not present too much confusion for everyone and we'll hope to promote as interactive a session as possible. So please feel free to keep your Q&As coming on the Q&A function on the webinar. Before I start the proceedings, I'd like to make a brief introduction to all of our panelists. Their bios are on our event registration website. And I'm sure you've had a good look at them. First is Professor Brenda Hannigan, who is Professor of Law at the School of Law at Southampton University. And then following which we have uh, Ms. Vanessa Knapp, who is visiting professor at UCL, as well as Queen Mary University of London and honorary professor at Brunel. Vanessa also holds an OBE for services to corporate law and was formerly partner at Freshfields before retirement. And finally, we have Dr. Jonathan Mukwiri, who is at the Durham Law School. So we have two academics on the panel today, very eminent and distinguished commentators in company law and a practitioner who has had years of experience in this area. So we are very privileged to have our panel here today. So without further ado, I would like to ask the panel the first question, which they have already had sight of, which is this, is it welcome for banks, financial institutions and other creditors to have a creditor duty that directors owe to them as confirmed and clarified? by the Supreme Court decision in the UK. The Supreme Court has chosen not to overrule the earlier case law. And what are your thoughts on this? And, and is this a welcome clarification? Anyone on my panel? I, I can start off, Iris, if you want me to. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I suppose given a choice between um, preserving the rule in West Mercia and uh, doing away with it, it's, it's certainly welcome that they preserved the rule. Um, that's the basis on which I think most um, practitioners have been operating for some time now. Um, but I'm not sure in practice that the decision will make an enormous difference to the position of the banks and the financial institutions. The big banks and the financial institutions um, can really look after themselves uh, and bargain for whatever protections they need in their dealings with the companies. And I think on the whole, they do a pretty good job on that. So the, the group of creditors who might um, benefit from it are the sort of other creditors who probably aren't in a position to uh, negotiate with the company on these things, because if the directors follow their duty, um, they will be amongst the ones who should benefit from that. Um, so I sort of give it a, 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 a welcome, but not say it's going to make a significant difference. I don't know if Brenda and Jonathan agree with me. Yeah, I, I would pretty much agree with that. Um, <clears throat> I particularly think the larger uh, creditors really, this has no impact on them at all. And I suspect for even the smaller creditors, once we get on to discussing when it actually applies, when it's triggered, it's triggered so late that it may also turn out in practice not to be something which will be a great actual value to them in terms of, you know, recoveries or anything of that nature. So um, that they preserve the rule. I suppose one of the things that I that struck me 
on reading the judgment was I was surprised there was so much debate about whether there was a rule at all. <laughs> I, I think as Vanessa says, and as one of, uh, I think it was Lord Hodge said, um, th there wasn't really any belief by people that there wasn't some obligation to creditors. Um, so I think that they preserved it, 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 it is not surprising. Yeah, I think I also agree. Um, probably what I would add, um, as I was reading the judgment, I thought um, on this question, probably there, there would be mixed feelings about it um, because until, um, until uh, the respondent in the Supreme Court started arguing that, that, that the Court of Appeal was wrong even to recognize that there was this duty at all. <laughs> um, until then, you look back from the, uh, the, the High Court, even the, the, the Court of Appeal, it wasn't much about that. Uh, rather, it was much about extending uh, when um, the, 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 the duty, which they all believed existed, uh, is triggered as, because the creditor do, cred, creditors wanted it to be triggered earlier enough. Um, and, and, and on that, they, 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 lost, uh, they lost that opportunity of, of, it, of the law being extended much, much earlier. And, and I think um, the creditors on that point would be dis, uh, disappointed. Uh, but of course, um, uh, yeah, they, they would be happy that it, it, it has been confirmed as existing and not overruled. Um, and, and many will, will have to continue to use it. Uh, but again, in practice, um, uh, as Vanessa says, uh, the, the big guys know how to protect themselves. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, my panel, for your for your thoughts. I mean, I, I was surprised too at the amount of uh, uh, um, effort that was put into arguing that the duty may not, you know, exist or or, may, or the earlier case law may be overruled because they came from lower courts. But I guess if the issue has gone to the Supreme Court, then 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 why why not? I I think it's an opportunity for all of this um, to be clarified. Um, we have a, a, a question uh, from uh, Eva Michaela, our colleague at uh, London School of Economics, uh, and this also very much ties in with uh, the follow on question that uh, my panelists have seen uh, ahead of time. Um, and, and Eva's point is, um, should we perhaps think about reforming the rules for accounting for environmental liabilities? Uh, because a case concerned a lawful dividend um, and there was an environmental liability which perhaps should have been given higher value. So I, I, I think um, this ties in with, um, I think that the question that I earlier prepared in terms of uh, the Lordship saying that um, if uh, a dividend has been paid lawfully, it doesn't mean that we can't question it uh, when it comes to dealing with uh, the question of whether directors have breached a duty uh, to creditors. Um, and, and my original question was on whether or not you see this necessary tension between shareholders' interests and creditors' interests. And I think uh, Eva's question for, further spotlights on um, uh, kind of involuntary creditors um, and, uh, and, and environmental liabilities. Um, I'm just wondering what the panel thinks of this um, in terms of kind of taking the, the question that I prepared earlier on uh, earlier legal acts, you know, on, on, on dividends, preferring shareholders' interests, and afterward, you know, realizing that uh, there might be other liabilities and interests um, on the part of creditors, especially involuntary creditors. Um, anyone? Well, I, I'll start if you like on that one. Um, on the dividend point, um, you saw that Lord Briggs dealt with it in only two paragraphs, and I would pretty much deal with it in only two paragraphs as well. Uh, I, I, I thought, it, again, it was a, a relatively self-evident point. I mean, we, I don't think we've ever believed that part 23 was the whole answer to whether a dividend um, is permissible or not. It, part 23 has always sat on top of uh, 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 the common law and then on top of director's duties. So they've always had an obligation as far as I, <laughs> as I understood it. Um, meet the requirements of part 23, but also then exercise your director's duties as to whether or not it is appropriate in the circumstances 
uh, to declare a dividend. I think Eva's point might uh, perhaps go more also to the point that was before Mrs. Justice Rose at first instance, really about the extent to which and I haven't gone back and looked at all of the detail of Mrs. Justice Rose's very detailed judgment on the accounting issues at, at first instance, but she was, um, I possibly would say, quite generous to the directors in allowing the provision that they made for the environmental liability. So I'm just wondering whether Eve is getting at the point that we need to tighten up the accounting requirements um, to make them make more explicit disclosures or maybe more detailed disclosures um, about these sorts of contingent liabilities. So it's more an accounting point rather than director's duties. I don't know what my other panelists think. Yeah, I might um, add on to that. Probably it, it probably might lend itself to what um, uh, Lady Arden um, talks about the kind of holistic assessment uh, of, 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 of the finances of the company and, and not simply balancing off at some point, even uh, we will come to look at uh, when the duties, uh, the creditor duties triggered, but not only balancing the interest of creditors um, against the interest of shareholders, but she mentioned other stakeholders, employees, and maybe then that aspect of environmental liability might also kick in. And, 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 and of course, this uh, uh, court uh, um, uh, case was simply focusing on the direct, I mean, the creditors' duties. Um, and, and she wanted to take a very broad view uh, of that. Probably the, the aspect we are talking about here would, would, would be captured by that minority view um, that, that you really have to balance all, all different interests. Yeah, I, I thought this was one of the helpful bits of the judgment in practice, because um, I think on the whole, people tend to concentrate on the rules about do you have distributable profits or not, and um, not concentrate as much on the section that um, preserves the common law in relation to payment of dividends. And um, I'm hoping that as a result of the judgment, people will remember to pay more attention to that. And I, I certainly remember situations in practice where, you know, if you looked at the company's relevant accounts, you said it had enough distributable profits available. Um, but then you had to point out to the directors that uh, either things had changed dramatically um, since the accounts have been prepared and they needed to take that into account or that there was something that was going to happen and they needed to take that into account before making their decision on whether to pay a dividend or not. So I do think I do think that is helpful. It, in a way, it's less helpful because they didn't really say very much about how the, the duty interacts with the, with the Part 23 um, requirements so to you know to exactly to what extent they are a restriction on what you can do and then to Eva's question I think the difficulty is if you're a director of a company and uh, you have as they did in this case a large contingent liability um, which is very uncertain it you won't know the outcome for some years to come one of the things that really impressed me in this case was the amount of work that the directors had done to try and get outside advice as to what the liability might be and you know the insurance available to them to cover it and things like that and for me in a way this is the sort of heart of uh, where we need to go following the case because we need to be able to allow directors to understand what they can and can't do. And I think that's why people find it so difficult is, you know, what is it reasonable for directors to do in a situation where there are some doubts about the solvency of the company and there are maybe various courses of action open to them, which hopefully will improve that, but might not. Um, so certainly if we, had, if we had different accounting provisions for environmental liabilities, uh, 
that would come after quite a lot of consultation um, where both companies and other interested groups of people would be able to put their points of view forward and we'd come to some conclusion about that. Uh, but whilst we're still a bit unclear as to exactly what this duty is and how it interacts with the ability to pay dividends, um, that leaves things a bit grey um, in some cases, I think. Um, Thank you. Oh, sorry. sorry, Brenda. Sorry, I was just going to say, yeah, it leaves it a bit grey, um, but there's really, <clears throat> it's really difficult for the courts, isn't it, to give mm. uh, to give any clearer guidance. Well, I think that's right. And that's why, in a way, a parliamentary process would be better uh, because, you know, a court can only look at the facts in front of us, which is part of the problem that we have in this case is that, uh, in a way, they were able easily to say, no, the duty didn't arise at this very early stage. Uh, but then trying to formulate what's the rule that directors should follow uh, to know at what stage they start thinking about the creditors' interests and um, balancing those against shareholders and other interested stakeholders um, as part of meeting their duties under 172. Yeah, so the, all the accounting discussion that is going on about, you know, what is distributable profits, as you say, will give a lot more, depending how all that evolves, along with the, you know, implementation of the reforms that that uh, Bayes uh, has promised in, in the white paper. Um, so there may be a lot of additional clarity on the accounting side, which would then help the directors in, in applying their duty, presumably. Yeah, it, I, I'm, as you know, I, for a long time, I've said that I thought maybe we should be thinking about moving to a solvency basis for whether we pay dividends or not. I mean, that has its own problems, too. Uh, but it, it's part of the same thing of trying to tell the directors what is it you have to think about before you make the judgment about whether you can pay the money out to shareholders or not. Yes, I agree with the, the dividend issue is a, is, is a difficult one. And, and it also implicates a whole, you know, kind of body of reform, um, because um, the payment of dividends not only affects some um, creditors and involuntary creditors, especially, uh, um, but um, also other stakeholders. And, and I mean, we, we can only be reminded of uh, the, the sort of the, the BHS uh, debacle and um, the, the decisions that were taken in, in that case, you know, in terms of uh, how distributions were made and, and whose uh, interests were being preferred. Um, I have uh, another comment uh, from Stelios Andriadakis, uh, who is our colleague at Brunel. Um, and Stelios sees this decision perhaps as a reflection of the long-term perspective or vision that directors should have under Section 172. I think creditors are not expressly mentioned in the 172 list, but but I think, I think there is this... Uh, um, certain theme, isn't it, in terms of how decision is actually consistent, perhaps with the idea that the creditors are very much a part of the 172 uh, list of stakeholders that uh, directors must have regard for. But I'm just wondering whether you see this as um, adding creditors to the list, or are creditors placed in a different position from the list of stakeholders in 172? Um, what, what are your views? Well, I think in practice, people have always assumed that um, uh, creditors were sort of part of what the directors should be thinking about because the list isn't um, exclusive. Um, and for most companies, you know, they are a very important part of the company's ability to continue and do business. Um, and I did think that some of the things that are said in the judgment um, about taking account of stakeholders' interests were, were quite helpful in thinking about the, the long term too. Um, most of that doesn't actually get as far as directors of small companies anyway. Uh, so, you know, it's only the fact that, that academics and practitioners um, pay attention to these things and then use it as part of uh, their advice to people who are actually doing this in real life. I, I suppose also the, the fact that um, really um, creditors' uh, liability or interest really kicks in when um, the company can't pay um, the creditors when uh, their, their money becomes due. Um, 
even being uh, being added to the list specifically probably wouldn't change much uh, because th they would only be concerned that they can't be paid when their debt becomes due. Right, thanks, Jonathan. Um, we do have another question that's broader in nature, uh, Alex Jardine's question, but I think I, I will I will postpone that to, to the end of the, the webinar because we have a, a similar kind of stop taking uh, question like that in relation to what this does, you know, after all, uh, for directors duty uh, to protect creditors. Um, and, and with that, I think let's um, kind of launch into uh, the, the, the more precise content of the duty, uh, which is when the duty is triggered and whether we have any clarification on that and what the content of the duty is and how the Supreme Court decision uh, has helped. So on when the duty is triggered, um, the majority judgment takes the view uh, that the director's creditor duty arises at the same time uh, as uh, the section 214 Insolvency Act uh, a point in time. That is, the director knows or ought reasonably to know that insolvency is uh, inevitable. Um, do you agree that that is the most sensible point in time? Any thoughts, uh, my panel? I, I, I disagree with the view that it that it's um, uh, coexists with 214. Uh, my reading of the judgment was that it applies ahead of 214, that 214 only kicks in when there's no reasonable prospect of avoiding insolvent liquidation administration, that it is inevitable and that this is going to kick in at an earlier point in time. As you say, they used varying uh, wording, uh, imminent insolvency, nowhere ought to know that it's around the corner or probable insolvent liquidation administration. Um, or law reads insolvent or bordering on insolvency. So all of that is ahead of the point where they uh, realize or, or ought to realize that insolvent liquidation is inevitable. So I think there is that small window. It's not the real risk. So we're not going all the way back to when there's a real risk. Um, they didn't like um, David Richards formulae either. So they brought it another bit closer. So to me, it's extremely close to 214, but it is actually ahead of 214. I don't know if Vanessa would agree yeah. with that. Jonathan is agreeing with me, but I'm not sure that. <laughs> <laughs> right, any thoughts, Vanessa? Yeah, I, I agree with Brenda too. I think part of the trouble is that as you read the judgments, it's, it's a bit like trying to grab hold of a slippery eel. You think you've just got what it is they're saying, and then they seem to say something that you don't think quite fits with what they said before, and they certainly don't seem to agree with each other, even though sometimes when they say they do. <laughs> uh, but, but I certainly think as a practical matter, um, if you were a director in, with a company in financial difficulties, it would not be safe to assume that this duty doesn't start to apply until you get to the stage where you're also at risk of liability under 214. Um, and if it did only kick in at the same stage, then, you know, what would be the point of it? But, but you know, even things like exactly what do we mean by insolvency, they have slightly different views as to what that means. I think it's um, Lady Arden who says that you should take the tests in one, two, three and apply them flexibly. They were a good starting point, but you know, then, then add some flexibility to that. And it comes back to this thing about the, I think the reason um, that we see these difficulties is because it is very difficult to formulate a proactive statement that tells the directors, you know, at what point should they start worrying about this? And then when they start worrying about it, what exactly should they be doing? Uh, and it was those problems, I think, that meant when the company law review looked at this and thought about trying to formulate a statement uh, that eventually we ended up with just this provision that preserves whatever the existing law was, um, or uh, the law if it does exist, uh, as Lady Arden says. Um, so I, I, do, I do think it is tricky. And in a way, I think it's quite hard to disassociate the when does the duty start to apply from the what is the duty. And, and there isn't always agreement on that precisely either. 
because they all say what the duty is in slightly different words. So I suppose the question is, given that they had, uh, what, 18 months to write this? <laughs> well, that, that of itself must demonstrate that they found it quite tricky too. <laughs> But that was the mystery then that after 18 months, as you say, just picking up your point, the judgments are actually quite hard to follow. Um, and there's quite a degree of repetition in them where they seem to circle back themselves on their own argument. Uh, uh, and then the wording keeps sort of slipping or changing um, ever so slightly. And, um, uh, and then Lady Arden seemed to take quite a different approach to everybody else. So, so it's quite hard, I think, to fit what she has to say into what the other four um, are, are saying, which sort of leaves us, I think, with the question of uh, wh what is it that they're telling us? Um, uh, it's all over to anyway. So, um, you know, and they and most of them were very careful to say, you know, we haven't heard arguments on all of this. So yeah. they were reserving the ability to come to a different conclusion when they are. Um, able to hear arguments on the various things. And they also kept saying, and we must remember the importance of giving practical guidance to, <laughs> to the profession. <laughs> but, but there was no practical guidance. <laughs> it, it's true um, that um, it, it, it sometimes felt, as I was reading the, the judgment, um, that it felt that it was difficult to say exactly what has has been decided on some other points, uh, even on this point. Um, as 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 you look at the judgment of of uh, Reed, I think yeah, um, he kind of agreed uh, uh, with the majority on 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 the fact that the, the duty is triggered when um, either insolvency is imminent or. Uh, liquidation, insolvency, liquidation, or administration is probable. But then he, he didn't want to be drawn so much about deciding uh, whether it was essential uh, that the directors know or ought to know. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the difference is, is almost academic, <laughs> so, um, you would think, but, but, but there he, he, he differs. And, and that, that slight difference you find in many other judgments on, on different uh, points they are making. Mm -hmm. Yes, and Lady Arden also didn't want to commit herself on um, the knowledge question and wanted to leave that for another time. I wondered about that because um, I think probably Jonathan's point, you know, d does it actually make any difference? Because since their obligations under 174 apply anyway, um, I just wondered how they would knit together, you know, even if you don't say that the test is you knew or ought to have known um, of imminent insolvency, well, you knew or ought to have known the situation anyway by virtue of 174. Mm. So, so I'm not sure there's much difference between Reed and, and Arden saying, well, we're not sure on that, and the others saying, well, you, it must be a case of ought or, uh, knew or ought to have known because of 174, but. Yeah, I thought so too. And I thought um, the, 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 the skewing of, 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 of that by, by Reed um, and, and Lady Aden is almost academic, which <laughs> I didn't expect of, of the judges to, to make a, a point about. Yeah, in this respect, I, I agree with Brenda. I think, I think, I read the judgments as being tending towards ultimately something much, much more objective. And, and you know, I think I think you're all right in saying that directors should be really quite careful in the approaching stage. Um, because I, I read the judgments as, as a point in time that is actually rather objective to, to everybody, that there is there is some inevitable inevitability, there's some no going back, you know, in terms of the situation and that directors ought to be aware of that and, and start, you know, basically um, having their sensitivities attuned uh, to creditors' interests. So maybe one of the key takeaways, you know, from, from our, you know, kind of unpacking of the judgment and teasing out some of these implications for practitioners is that um, um, a, a rather precautionary approach actually probably ought to be taken um, by directors, which probably means um, more, more business in terms of advisory work on legal risk. 
Yeah, I think in a way, um, a part of the problem is that it, in real life, uh, as the judges recognize, it can be really difficult. Uh, so you can have a company which is insolvent because there's a mismatch between when your debts fall due and um, when you could normally realize your assets or something like that. Uh, but it may be relatively easy to do something um, to sort that out. Um, and I, I thought it was quite helpful that there was recognition in the judgments that um, if directors make a reasonable decision to try and rescue uh, the situation you've got yourself into so that the business does carry on as a viable business, you wouldn't, that wouldn't involve a breach of duty. And that ties in with what Brenda was saying about the, the director's duty to, to meet the standards that would be expected, given your own knowledge and what's to be expected of someone in your position. And I think maybe something around that uh, is where the, the solution to this, this difficulty of actually getting a bit clearer as to you know, when you should start doing things. But, but it's also, and it comes up in, um, when they start talking about you know, inevitable permanent insolvency um, and, and contrasting that to these situations where uh, although you might technically be insolvent, you know, there's a good chance you can, you can put things right relatively easily. Um, so maybe that's the area that we should be honing in on, uh, because if you take the extreme examples that are given in some of the judgments where uh, you could possibly rescue the company, but only by taking something that is very, doing something that's very risky, mm -hmm. uh, which if it goes wrong means that there's a significant detriment <laughs> to the creditors. But you know, then you can tweak the facts of. A, a bit from that and you can say well what about um, a situation where you could do something that's quite risky um, and maybe the detriment to the creditors it's a bit of a detriment but not that much of a detriment you know how, and those are the sorts of situations that the directors have to deal with um, but I thought I thought it was ultimately very favorable to directors in the sense there was quite a number of the judges made points about limited liability is there in order to uh, allow the transfer of risk to creditors. Creditors know this, they understand it, they've understood it's in Solomon, um, and they must contract, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and uh, you know, the guardians of their own interests. There was also references to the importance of not fettering the business judgment of the directors. Um, uh, so when you, when you, and then moving the timeline, say, very close to 214. So I thought actually um, that uh, for directors, it was sort of an acknowledgement of this will all be very difficult. Some of it could be temporary. Some of it could be permanent. You may have solutions. Um, we're going to leave a lot of it to your subjective good faith and business judgments and management of risk really close up to the end. Yeah, I think, um, sorry. Go on, Johnson, you get yeah, him. Um, yeah, and I think um, probably, uh, uh, I don't know if Vanessa mentioned this, um, it, it, it might boil down to the, um, the independent judgment for, I mean, uh, independent um, advice uh, that maybe they get um, so that when, when then it comes to to issue of liability, where, whether they knew that whatever action they have taken, whether they think this is temporary and when it's actually permanent and they read the financial um, deep as, as, as temporary when it's not, or maybe they, they read uh, their examples in the, in, the, in the judgment about pandemic, temporary uh, event, which probably will go away if we simply push on further. If they have misread all that, um, I think it strengthens uh, the, the, their case as directors if they have independent um, advice and they have consulted some other professionals and they could show that, that they, they really took that into account. Um, and, and then somehow then uh, the, the scale of where they are at, whether they are really very close to insolvency or even liquidation imminent or probable, uh, whatever classification is, they may not still 
uh, trigger uh, issue of liability. Yeah, I certainly think getting independent advice is going to be um, very helpful to anyone who finds themselves in this situation. And for the bigger companies, um, you would hope that that's what they do. For the smaller companies, um, maybe they're less likely to do that. Yeah, I, I particularly agree with um, um, the discussion on um, uh, uh, that, that, that Brenda's made about um, this decision actually being quite generous to directors, especially all the references to uh, distinguishing between what is permanent insolvency and what might be temporary or, or cash flow squeezes in nature. I think the the, the lordships are very mindful uh, uh, of uh, getting um, of understanding, I mean, directors' dilemmas in these situations. I think that the past 18 months might have been useful in them basically looking at how the pandemic and the lockdowns would work out and what sort of business risks actually uh, that, that directors run. Um, I'm just wondering whether, you know, judging from um, what um, you have fed back so far as, as a panel, whether it is clear for directors that um, if they find themselves in this situation, they're getting a financial opinion uh, on the state of their, their precarity, wh wh whether a financial opinion thinks this is closer to permanent, you know, or temporary insolvency, is that, do, do you think that is best practice? I certainly think it would be helpful, not, not so much, um... Uh, I don't think directors would think about it so much in, in terms of permanent or temporary, but, but th this is doing that exercise of looking forward and seeing where you might be going and then thinking about, well, what are our options and what could we do and how good or bad is that? And maybe talking to your creditors about whether you can... Uh, change the way that your your debts are configured and or you know whether you should be thinking about some more formal procedure uh, as a way of of making progress on something i mean all of that i think is is going to be really helpful but we we thought all of that beforehand so in a way <laughs> i'm not sure that it's it's really changed um that much because in in a way i think that that what what we might have hoped the judgment would do was to give us some more bright lines. But I think what the judgment does is to show us that actually we haven't got any bright lines still. Um, and so we just have to continue to live with some of the gray areas and, and having to be cautious about the way that we do things. But I wonder, is, is this you know also what they wanted to do? They just wanted to leave a gray area because even leaving the gray area advances us a little bit in the sense that aren't they really just sending a message to directors that says look there's lots of points of detail here which we'll work out later when we get a case that suits the facts uh, the facts suit us um, but for the minute we just want to flag to you that when things are dire um you should be thinking of your creditor's interests, which would involve all of those sorts of things like taking independent advice and going to your accountants and speaking to your creditors and so on and so forth. So that to a large extent, what they want to achieve, they have achieved by emphasizing, A, there is a duty, so we can park that debate about whether there's any obligation here at all. Of course, not a freestanding duty, but a duty within 172. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and and flagging that there's a bit of uncertainty about it. So when you are a bit uncertain about your financial position, this is something that should come into your consideration of your advisors and how you now deal with your employees, your your suppliers, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Just a message. Yes. <laughs> well, and, and I think that's right, because um, I'm not sure, as I said before, that, that it's necessarily would be the right thing to do for, for the Supreme Court to lay down uh, hard law about something when the Company Law Review found it so very difficult to do that. 
Right, I think this probably leads us nicely into the next part, which is on the content of the duty, because as, as um, all panelists have pointed out, um, the content of the duty is still really rather uh, vague and grey. And I think Lord Briggs himself says that the impressive unity of the authorities about the existence of the duty is not matched by any similar unanimity about its precise content. Uh, and, and I think that's, um, that, that's what we are, we are kind of uh, splitting hairs over and struggling with. I mean, what, what is the the precise content uh, of this duty. Um, Lady Arden's formulation is uh, to avoid harming creditors' interests at the point the duty arises. Um, but um, I read the majority's um, judgments as suggesting that all it takes is um, taking into consideration of creditors' interests. So I think this formulation is slightly different from Lady Arden's, which is a bit more stringent. Um, I don't, what do you think of this? And, and do you have any thoughts about what the content should be? Yeah, I'll probably um, start off that. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, as I was reading through, um, I thought probably it might be summarized uh, as twofold. Um, again, the, uh, tied into when the, the duty is triggered um, so that um, before it, uh, it, it almost aligns with uh, section 214 um, at that point, then the, the, the duty entails uh, balancing the, the, the interest of creditors and the interest of shareholders. And if you like um, Lady Adams' uh, view, wider other interests, uh, but simply balancing them um, and, and seeing where the much damage, uh, again, using um, Lady Adams' uh, words, uh, lie, and, and, and you decide along that scale. Um, so simply balancing those interests uh, more closely. And, and then when the, 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 the scale goes further, such as that um, insolvency, liquidation, or administration is probable, then there the creditor's interest is not really balanced against um, shareholders' interest, but now they become uh, the prominent interests you, you, you simply focus on. And, 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 and some other points uh, made in the judgment that at that point, the, the shareholders do not have um, really valuable interest in, in, uh, than the, 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 the creditors. And, and I think probably that is the twofold I read from the judgment. Um, again, if we agree that the, 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 the duty kicks in uh, way before or at least near the, the insolvency uh, section 214 um, uh, point, uh, th th that aligns with simply balancing um, the interest and not simply that you are only focusing on the interest of, of creditors exclusively. Right, a uh, very interesting in terms of kind of the degree of intensity. I think I think that that very much is reflected Lord Reed's judgment as well as he as he talked about the greater intensity of consideration for creditors' in, interest um, as um, as directors become much more aware clearly that permanent insolvency might be inevitable. Um, just wondering what my other panelists think uh, of this approach. Well, I mean, I think this is back to what I was saying about it's quite favorable to uh, directors because it says, you know, weigh them up, balance them, consider the position, the financial position you're in. Is it rapidly deteriorating or whatever? Um, uh, and then exercise your business judgment as to what you subjectively think is in the best interest um, of the company in that extended way that, that we're now doing. So, um this is where I think I think Lady Arden's is much further along, and I, I didn't see any support in the other four judgments for her point about you must a positive duty that you must not take steps to uh, how did she phrase it to uh, to harm they must avoid harming creditors' interests. Um, I think that would actually uh, involve a degree of priority to the creditor 
creditors, which is not suggested by the other four, they all say that there's no paramount duty to the creditors until 214 um, uh, is triggered. So uh, I think she, her formulation is, is much narrower, um, but it's not one that seems to have appealed to the other four. So I think she's definitely in the minority on that. Yeah, and I think, um, as I said earlier, that, that it's a question of the, the time of when the duty applies and the, what the duty is. Those two are sort of very closely bound together because you can see that if the, if the time is very close to when 214 would apply anyway, um, it must be the case that it, it, the interests of the creditors are likely to weigh more in the balance because it's, it's much more likely that they are the ones who are going to have the economic interest in what remains of the company after it goes into insolvent liquidation. But if you if the time at which the duty is triggered is earlier and the more it, it's earlier, the, the more it seems reasonable to say that that what you should be doing is you should be thinking about shareholders and creditors interests as well as all the other stakeholder interests. But but given that we broadly seem to think that under 172, you should have been thinking about all of that anyway. Um, and as, as we agree, it's for the directors to decide how to balance those competing interests. And that, I mean, they, they do talk about um, creditor interests increasing as the financial problems get more serious. Um, and so you get this sort of sliding scale idea. But part of the problem is that, that life isn't like that. It isn't a sort of beautifully calibrated scale where you can tell how far along the scale you are and all the time you're, what you're doing is you're balancing different risks and possibilities and trying to make difficult judgments about whether something will or won't work and whether you'll be able to get people to agree to things. So it's, it, it would be nice to be able to reduce it to a simple formula, but, but it, it's difficult. I, I do agree. I think Lady Arden when she talks about protecting creditors from harm. And I think she goes as far as to say, not omitting to do something that would you know, be for the benefit of the creditors. And I, I was a bit worried about that because it wasn't exact, very clear to me exactly at what stage um, that requirement would apply. And I think that, would, that could make life very difficult for directors. Right, thank you, thank you all for this. Um, I, I think two two final questions on on kind of the, the broad appeal of, of this judgment, uh, and one tying in with uh, Alex Jardine's question that has remained open until now, uh, which is, um, what does a creditor duty actually do for 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 creditors? Um, does it does it f fill a gap? You know that uh, that is truly problematic at the same time. Um, and and Alex thinks that uh, to what extent do you see you know this judgment as actually a missed opportunity to extend the protection of creditors? So you know from the creditors' point of view, um, perhaps this judgment doesn't seem to be you know too too generous uh, um, for for them. And 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 we can we can see why as well. Um, and any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I'm not sure whether, whether um, they set out to um, try and achieve something other than uh, other than answer the question in front of them, although perhaps Lady Arden's long discourse on the background to how Section 172 came about suggests that she wanted to make sure people understood what her views were about 172 and how that worked. Um, and I do think there are there are some things that are said in the judgments that are quite helpful about how we think about directors' duties generally. Um, but I suppose the practical points that I would take from it are that um, if you want to avoid having to worry about this area, the first thing is make sure you've got good up-to-date accounting information and you look at it um i think it will it sh if people follow what's said in the judgments they would also be more careful about the process they follow once they think they're getting into financial difficulties because they need to be able to demonstrate that they are thinking about the balance between creditor interests and shareholder interests and for lots of people they're more likely to do a better job on that if they take some professional advice i think 
Um, and also that means that they'll have the benefit of being able to test what they as individuals think against uh, the independent uh, assessment of professionals who practice in this area and maybe have more experience than some of the directors do. Um, and I, but I think that the $64 million question is, um, when is it reasonable for the directors to take a risk to keep the business going and rescue it? Um, and how do you work out whether the creditors are going to be worse off the, the um, insolvency deepening that they talk about in the judgments? Uh, so, you know, that and, and how much practical help you get with that, I'm not sure. The yeah. other friend, uh, Jonathan. Yes, Jonathan. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I thought um, probably what it, it really does, um, uh, the, the credit duty really does to the creditors in comparison to other uh, insolvency provisions is, is simply bring, um, go back a little bit, uh, just a little bit, um, when these other provisions hasn't kicked in. That, that there is a small window in time where the creditor duty can kick in. And then they can always have ways of looking at the actual uh, um, facts of what has happened to see whether they can fit th that in, in, into this duty uh, before the other insolvency provisions kicks in. So it's, it gives them something to, to argue about that, that, that there is something here and we can claw back whatever amount we can get. Um, but that is always going to be difficult uh, because of the subject, subjective analysis that might be put on what exactly the directors did and knew and, and, and what advice they took. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. And as, as I said earlier, I think really this is more of a message than, than anything else. It's, it's a flag to them. Um, that what we want is engaged, informed directors who are exercising care, skill and diligence, aware of the financial position of their company. And we appreciate their businessmen taking business risks and women and in, in business risks in a context where everything is moving quite quickly and there may be different options available to them and so on. And therefore, we will, of course, respect their bona fide decisions and their business judgment in this context. As to whether anybody will enforce this, I think we'll find again that it will usually only be in egregious cases where not only have they not prefer not acted in the creditor's interest, but they have acted to prefer themselves or connected creditors in some way. Um, and, and then you just say, well, this is really covered by 239, why bother? Well, you saw most of the judges explained why this is actually wider and more useful in some ways than 239. So it may actually just provide another weapon for a liquidator uh, in uh, those sorts of um, egregious cases. But you wouldn't expect to see many directors being uh, sued for breach of this um, expanded duty as, as now identified in uh, Sipana. Right, thank you very much. I, I think my, my, my final question um, really has to do with the, the other side. And that is, um, you know, looking at the point of view of people who might hope that this decision would give more ammo to, to creditors. Uh, it seems as if uh, di directors are, are, are given a bit more breathing space. So would you agree that um, the legal risk for directors is not really significantly increased, actually, and, and nothing more than what's really expected under Section 172 anyway? Um, and, and, any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I agree with, with with that. I think kind of sums up um, uh, that really uh, probably the directors are more to benefit from this. Uh, that now they they, they 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 can't be worried about um, the the their liability and the duty being so uh, extended and very open uh, that uh, because they take uh, business risks all the time. Um, so they, they can't be worried that once there is a, a real risk, um, albeit not, not, not so close to 214, th then you, you are about uh, the duty kicking in. Um, and on the other hand, the creditors 
um, have not got what they had wanted to extend uh, that, that, that point. Right, that's my, do my panelists have anything else to add uh, to, um, I think we are about five minutes to the close. Any general thoughts on uh, perhaps the achievements, the gaps, or what else you might like to see, you know, in the development in this area of jurisprudence? Well, uh, can I avoid that question? I will leave that to Vanessa um, and, and, <laughs> and answer a different question, which, <laughs> which is, <laughs> is there anything else we'll comment on? The only other thing I would pick out from the judgments is it's also very pro shareholder, just as it's, it's, you know, I think very supportive of director's business judgment. It's very supportive of um, shareholders. I think uh, in making two particular points, one that the shareholders' interests do not become irrelevant until insolvent liquidation is uh, inevitable. So the shareholder interest, even though there had been some discussion in the cases as to whether it fades away earlier than that, is in existence right up to the moment of insolvent liquidation. Um, and you also see that point reflected in their um, point that Lord Briggs made about we don't want to have real risk for lots of reasons, but in particular, we don't want to have it because it would infringe on the shareholders ability unanimously to um, to uh, approve acts as acts of the company. So both of those are, are strong shareholder primacy type points. I'll leave Vanessa to deal with the creditors. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I suppose I I would say I, I don't think it's a missed opportunity because um, I, my, my view is that it wouldn't have been right to go down the real risk route. Um, and I, I say that because I think all business involves taking risks. And so I go back to my question about at what stage uh, does it become unreasonable for the directors to take a risk to try and keep the business going as a long-term sustainable viable business um, and how do you guide people as to what to do so uh, I mean I if you had assumed that um, the decision that we got was the one that we were going to get because I think broadly speaking most people didn't think the real risk was the the right answer and had been behaving accordingly um, so we've sort of stayed where we where we were, uh, with apparent with quite a lot more um, to go on in terms of where the judges think maybe the dividing line should be drawn, but not complete clarity on that. Um, and uh, as I said, I thought some of the some of the comments in the judgments about directors' duties generally um, were quite helpful. Uh, and and the fact that that you know the meaning of members as a whole and and the fact that when you're thinking about the creditors you're thinking about creditors as a whole not individual creditors that that was all useful and helpful too and as I said before I think that the the point in relation to dividends that you've always had to think about the common law as well um, just the fact that that's been reiterated might might permeate through a bit more than it has done in the past. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. I don't think we have any further questions that have come in. Uh, possibly last chance for anyone who might want to pose um, a comment or any questions to the panel. I mean, we've had a number of uh, colleagues from other institutions join us uh, and a number of students as well from our company law classes. So this has been immensely helpful uh, to everyone elucidating this judgment. Um, I mean, it, it, it is long, uh, but I think that the difficulty with this judgment is how is how grey it is and how vague sometimes things are. And and um, and as all of us have have grappled with it, but we have kind of made sense of it as to why it needed uh, to be somewhat grey and somewhat vague as well. Uh, but thank you all today for coming onto the webinar and giving your views and, gi and and giving your thoughts. I'm sure everybody here has benefited greatly from this. Uh, so thank you all, my panelists. Uh, and thank you all, uh, the audience, for sticking with us, uh, especially a big thank you to those who have um, put their comments and their questions on the Q&A. Um, 
I think it remains for me to wish everyone a very good afternoon and hopefully we'll catch up in person uh, in due course. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.